I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh Hutch Jr. laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hudson Jr. Welcome to Steel City Resistance. This is episode number 73. I'm located in Brookline, a neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh, deep down in the SCR bunker. And I'm Ward Miller, also in the city of Pittsburgh, here in Mission Control. And 73 episodes in, and we're still going strong. we got plenty more in us, uh, all the way up to and beyond the election. So we've said before, and we'll say it again, we don't... You know, we call a pig a pig, and if if Mitt Romney hopefully wins and just moves Obama out of the White House, we'll be watching him too. Absolutely, this uh, this show, although it was uh, spurred on by uh, Obama a little bit, uh, he'll he'll make anybody political. I'm telling you, I've talked politics with more people lately that never talked to politics before uh, than ever before. I mean, it's just uh, it's everywhere. If you're not if you're not interested in what's going on in our country, how about don't vote? You know. Yeah, that'd be the best. Well, because I'm sure that the Democrats will have somebody that'll vote for you. So it really. Yeah, that's happen. true. That's true. Uh, I guess what we want to do right off the bat, Ward, is we kicked off a you kicked off uh, a new campaign. We have a, a Twitter account now, and uh, it's it's a little tough. I was a little bit leery about this. It's why I didn't really bring it up, but I, I think it's a good idea. But we're hovering around like just a few followers. So you guys got to follow SCRPGH so we can get that uh, blowtorch up. Yeah, well, one of the reasons is I wanted to create a line of demarcation between the stuff that we do, you right. know, the jokes and the, and the silly stuff we do. And the and other the serious websites. political stuff. Yeah, so we wanted the serious political stuff to have its own channel. And that, that's good, too. That's good because... Uh, you know, like you said, a lot of our things are funny, and sometimes the the stuff that we put up that pertains to the show uh, is a little more serious and and whatever. It's just a good idea. It's that's the reason that we made the show too, because yeah. cause our other you know we we're not serious all the time, like Democrats. Yeah. You know, we're not, <laughs> we have, we have a life outside of this uh, that we enjoy. So, SCRPGH, ladies and gentlemen, give us a follow, and uh, Ward's administering that. I appreciate that. Good deal. Uh, I was on Facebook the other night, Ward, and I, I rarely do this anymore. I mean, when you get on the local Pittsburgh people that, that post stuff and, and then you start trying to have a dialogue in Pittsburgh with people about Obama and politics and stuff, you're kind of outnumbered. And uh, leftists tend to get ugly right away. You know, they it's hard to have a, a good dialogue. But I was, I've managed to have a dialogue with this guy, but he was totally empty-headed. I mean, this guy had drunk the Kool-Aid. Just completely. I know you uh, have heard the uh, president's uh, presentation and of how he, how federal spending over the last three years has gone down in his uh, in his under his watch, and, and this guy, yeah. and this guy was touting that right, and, and I said, okay, you got it. His first year, and I'm just using numbers, because this is how he this is how he came up with this. His first year, he spent 3.9 trillion. His second year, he spent three point five trillion. His third year, he spent three point one trillion. I said, "Knucklehead, add that shit up." <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It came down a little bit, but go back two years before that, or twenty years before that, or a hundred years before that, or two hundred years. You know what I mean? Yeah. This guy, well, it, he couldn't get it. Here's the way that they that the Obama administration was able to say that with a straight face is because they used fuzzy math. OK, because Obama came in and the fiscal year doesn't start until September. OK, so Obama comes into the White House in January from January till September. That's still on the books as Bush's budget. Yeah, he didn't so count. He, the, he didn't and, count and, and if you remember, as soon as he got into office, he signed the tarp. He signed all this stuff. Right. So that actually on, from a bookkeeper standpoint took place during Bush's watch. Right. So that was actually credit. 
in the books, it's credited to Bush. It's not credited to Obama. So Obama said, oh, since I've been, you know, since I've been on the books, and da-da-da. well, he's right. Since he's been on the books, which started September the year he, he was uh, put into the White House and he was sworn in, from that September, he had already done a shitload of spending before that. And we're but talking that all got credited to the Bush. And we're talking multiple trillion dollars each year. Oh, absolutely. And, and he was right. The guy was right. Federal spending has been on a downward trend <laughs> from $3.8 trillion to $3.5 trillion to three. But so what? You know because what I mean? we ran out of money. Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to tell this guy, and it wasn't working out. And then, you know, one of his buddies had to come on there and had to get all ugly with me, and I had to give him a couple couple uglies back, and then that was the end of that. But, uh, you know, it, it, just, it deteriorates so rapidly. And I try not to do, try not to get into that, but, you know, sometimes it hits you. You know, you get a case of the ass with them, and I had to tell them, yeah. you, don't, you don't have a father, do you? You know, <laughs> I had to. My, uh, my friends at work call me the uh, thread killer because normally what I'll do is I'll follow a thread and people, you know, bitching and whatnot, and then I'll just, I, I stick them with something that just stings them so bad <laughs> they can't come back. That's what I did. This guy never came back after I hit him with yeah. that. That's, that's, that's called the... Uh, that's called the thread killer. After, you know, I told him that his <laughs> his neighbors were supporting his tired ass. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, hey, how about this? You know, something that happened here this week uh, that it stunned me when it happened. When Mayor Bloomberg in New York City, the Demi in chief there, uh, he banned soda pop that's higher than, that's larger than 16 ounces. And I'm thinking, who does this guy think he is? And what does he think he's going to accomplish by doing this? Well, here here's the deal with that. It's it's a Bloomberg is trying to create the perfect nanny state, and in order to create the nanny state, you have to have laws that are ridiculous, and so we're looking out for you. So it's one of them them uh, tete a tetes where it there it's the perfect question. They say, okay, we're going to limit these large sugary drinks so that you can't buy them because it's good for your health. However, here's the problem that that nobody really talked about. And this is one of the ones that you can sting them with in, in a uh, thread and kill the thread. The problem is you can't buy a drink larger than 16 ounces. However, if the place offers free refills, you could sit there all day and refill it all day. Or you can get so, up there and say, can I get three of those 15 ounces, please? Yeah, and that's exactly what's <laughs> going to happen. The people that, that, that drink a 20-ounce coffee are going to go buy two 16 ounces. It's ridiculous. Instead of, and, you know, it, it's... It's re- yeah, you're and it's arrogant. Beyond. It's arrogant too. It's really arrogant. I mean, it's like PNC Park. I've said it before, uh, mainly on my other show, but PNC Park telling me that we're outside and I can't smoke. Huh? Yeah. Why not? I mean, I can understand. You can't leave the you can't leave the park and come back with your ticket stub like you can at any other venue in the world. You know, it's like really. You know what? You know what the end result is. I haven't been to a baseball game in two years. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I mean, I can understand you not being able to, to smoke in, in the crowd. Put me out know, by the in, dumpster in somewhere. Seats. Yeah, but, I mean, th- there should be a, a, an area. Because, I mean, you go to a Steeler game, you can. Right. I know. You just got to leave the seating area. It's so if ridiculous. If you go out to the, to the rotundas or whatnot, you can sit there and smoke all day. And, I mean, I'm not going out there and freaking smoking like a chimney when I go to a ball game. It's just that now that you told me I can't, then I'm not coming to the ball game because I think that's arrogant. Well, and it's part of – that's also – The damn the science isn't even settled on that. It's still all part of the nanny, nanny stuff exactly. because I, I know better than you do. I know what's best for you, so you're going to listen to what I say. But if we're sucking down all your money in the casino, by God, oh, yeah. you can smoke inside there. Yeah. You know? Because the, they, they want to keep you there as long as Absolutely. they can. Because once you, once you buy a baseball ticket, you walk in, they've already made their money. So if, if you buy a couple hot dogs or something, it, you made the money back. However, you go to the casinos, you, you know, they don't want you to put in a couple bucks and then leave because you want to smoke a cigarette. They'll, they'll make all the accommodations they can for you to not leave. Anything to keep you on the premises Absolutely. is what they're going to do. And there's little old ladies walking around with oxygen and shit. I oh, mean, yeah. I mean, it's like, I don't even go. they oxygen in their nose and they're smoking cigarettes. Oh, it's like that. And they're on like a motorized four-barrel <laughs> carburetor wheelchair. You know, yeah. and the other ones that aren't on the wheelchair yet are moving so damn slow you can't get past them in those aisles. And uh, I, I just think that whole thing with him and his soda pie, he's going he's gonna to end up, I think he's going to end up eating that one. 
I don't think they're well, gonna, I don't think they're going to go with that. How do you it, enforce it? Well, it, it's simple. They find the, the, the places that do. But who does you know, it? So, well, for example, Starbucks. You go to Starbucks and you say, "I want a, a venti coffee." That's twenty ounces. Yeah. You can't. They, they're not allowed to sell them anymore. If they sell them, they're going to fine them. But I mean, it's kind so of. So they're going to. The, the city's going to make money on the fines <laughs> for people who do this. They're ruining the thirty-two ounce cup. Uh, economy you know the industry yeah the I mean, large vessel <laughs> yeah i mean truck drivers right. i mean there's all the big gulps it's you just another get... it's another reason to stay the hell away from new york city who's lost like two million people in the last three years or something i, I heard i'm sure they have because the you know the their uh the their entire city government's just totally backwards ass there's there's no easy way you know no nice way of saying it they're they're just wrong i forget and, the numbers but there's something like 20,000 there's 8 million people in new york there was at one time back when i remember there was a song with 8 million stories mm -hmm. you know but something like 20,000 or 40,000 people are the people that pay the revenues that run new york city I'm sure. It's not very many, man. Most of those people are not paying their way. And what's going to end up happening is it's going to be like Detroit. Yep. You go on our website, and the number one hit uh, video on our website is LBJ's, uh, what was it, LBJ's something cities, model cities program. Yep. LBJ's model. you got to watch that. That's a must watch. That is a damnation. I would like to take that to city councils everywhere, including this city, and just play it for them. And say, if you get everything that you want, this is what's going to end up happening right here. Yeah. And it did. It's horrible, man. I mean, you sent me a thing about about Detroit that has some of the same pictures that are in that movie. I mean, that's just, it's a cry and shame. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to, you need to re if you're on the fence on where you sit and, and, and how these different ideologies turn out, uh, Go watch, go do your own research on, on the city of Detroit and start in 1940 and end today and watch the metamorphosis of what leftists and unions and the whole nine yards, everything Michigan throws at them. Just look at what happens. I went to a school in outside of Detroit. I went to a, a military school uh, on, on the M1 tank, actually, uh, out in, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the town, Warren, Michigan. It's about 15 miles outside of Detroit, I guess. But they told us, the instructors in that school told us, if you, because it was like a three-week-long school and we had weekends off in between, and they said, do not go past. The, the, the roads are numeric. In other words, ground zero, then you got one, oh, sorry about that. You got one-mile road, two-mile road, three-mile road, four-mile road, all the way out until you get to the outskirts of the city. And they told us, do not go past nine-mile road. So they basically gave up almost 10 miles of a major American city and told us it was too dangerous to go there. Yeah, and they, they told Army guys. Yeah. you know who, These are who other Army guys telling us. Yeah, the, and, and these are Army guys who have no fear of going into, into foreign countries with people <laughs> shooting at them. Unbelievable. And, well, I mean, and, and that was the case, you know, and that was one of the cases that was made early on in the uh, Iraq War when everybody was saying how, you know, all these people, these soldiers are dying, you know, and da, da 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 And and the bottom line is, if you take the police report for Chicago or, and Chicago's just as bad, it's not quite where Detroit is yet. Well, there's still people in way. Chicago, and it's on its way. There's still but, a lot of people there, though. The people have run away from Detroit. They've they've lost whole neighborhoods that are empty now. But what what's going to end up happening is you're going to see in in Detroit. You know, you look at the police reports. There's more people killed in Detroit in, you know, in a weekend than there was killed in months in Iraq. Yeah, I saw that report. It's especially bad. Uh, okay, hold on. Let's get this straight here. Go ahead, Ward. No, it's one of them things where, you know, it's a shame that, you know, when, when you say, you know, there's, you know, 60 people shot, four people maimed, there were 16 people raped. And this isn't in a war zone. This is in a, yeah. a major American city. It's something. And, and you know what they're planning on doing? And Chicago is actually worse. Chicago is like 50 murders a weekend, man. It's freaking nuts. 
Yeah. And it's all but black on more black. People there. That, that, that goes to your point. There's still more right. people in Chicago than there is in Detroit. And with, even with Detroit's dwindling population, they're still the, right. they're, in they're the at, top five. I think they're uh, at 700,000. They used to be at like 3 million or something like that. And Chicago's known as the second city, so that's like the number two uh, city. But what they're planning on doing in Detroit is they're, they're already doing it. They can't maintain all the streetlights, and they want to move the population they want to nudge. Cass Sunstein wants to nudge them to where they get them, where they know where everybody is. So they're just not going to fix the streetlights in the downtrodden areas. They're going to try to move the population. I think it's despicable, man. I do. The yeah, way that, they that use these people. Like the way they use these people, you know, it's, it's just uh, – and, and those murders, they were they – were, the majority of them, 90 percent, were black-on-black crime. And I, I miss Jesse Jackson. I think he had a special on. You know, oh, maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't even say anything about it, probably. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a crying shame. They're talking about when, when Obama was first uh, inaugurated, there was a plan. I haven't seen where it's gone, uh, but there was 25 cities where they were planning on bulldozing areas, raising areas, and planting grass. And Pittsburgh was one of them. I mean, it was uh, – I, I don't know if they were talking about uh, – I, I don't know which neighborhoods they were talking about. There's some over on the north side that are like – pretty bad that you can see the houses like in Detroit with the holes in the roof and the windows blown out and mm -hmm. like five or six of those in a row you know so I don't know if they're talking about that or Manchester I think well while we were talking I looked it up and the we'll, we'll just go with the top five the top five worst crime areas in the United States are number one let, is, let me let me try to guess one okay is, go ahead. is Miami Dade one of them uh not in the top five. Okay, good. I won't embarrass right. myself any further. Uh, number one is Detroit, Michigan. Mm. Number two is St. Louis, Missouri. Democrat. Three is Memphis, Tennessee. Democrat. Four is Oakland, California. Communist. And number, and number five <laughs> is Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah, nice. Baltimore's horrible anymore. That's that's a shame, too. I mean, I, and, I, I told you last week or a couple weeks ago, they have a – a state representative that that put out a bulletin do not come to inner harbor just don't do it until they can until the state can secure this because the city sure can't yeah that's that's just a crying shame it really is uh incidentally if you've been noticing lately all of obama's not all of them but a lot of obama's colleagues and his supporters are starting to bail on him and i heard a uh, a pretty uh telling explanation of that we all we all don't like him for the same reason. People on the right don't like him because he lies right to our face, and people on the left think that he's a Marxist. No, we know he's a Marxist, but they're acting, they're like, why don't you just say you're a Marxist? You know, you're not going far enough. So everybody hates him for the same reason. Yeah. Dis dislikes him. Let's go with that. Yeah, we'll say dislikes him because <laughs> hate, hate's a strong word. It is. Your weekly jihad report, May 19th to May 25th. Jihad attacks 41. Alawa Akbar's 5. Dead bodies 253. Critically injured 529. Wow. Something else, but it is what it is, and we have to and, report and it, it. And it's one of the things where we gotta we gotta report it. We gotta tell everybody, you know, and we gotta get everybody on the same page and understanding what we're talking about yep. when we say it's that no these joke. people. They, they don't they don't like us it's no joke they don't like each other they don't like life yeah. they're 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 buried in in hate i mean it's just uh if, if everybody's getting along and everybody's beautiful and then their whole outlook on life goes away but anyway uh i think that uh obama might have made a mistake at the state of the union when he called out the uh chief justice of the supreme court he might be in a little trouble yeah. Ever since Obama assumed the office of the president, critics have hammered him on a number of constitutional issues. Critics have complained that much, if not all, of Obama's major initiatives run headlong into constitutional roadblocks on the power of the federal government. Obama certainly did not help himself in the eyes of the court when he used a venue in the State of the Union address earlier in the year to publicly flog the court over its ruling that the First Amendment grants the right to various organizations to run political ads during the time of an election. The tongue lashing clearly did not sit well with the court, as demonstrated by Justice Sam Alito, who publicly shook his head and stated under his breath, that's not true. 
you can see that that on that video on YouTube also. Uh, when Obama told a flat out lie concerning the court's ruling, as it turned out, this was a watershed moment in the relationship between the executive and the judicial branches of the federal government. Obama publicly declared a war on the court, even as he blatantly continued to propose legislation that flies in the face of every known constitutional principle uh, upon this nation, which has stood for over 200 years. Obama has even identified Chief Justice Roberts as his number one enemy. That is, apart from Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, Beck, Hannity, and so on. And it's no accident that the one swing vote on the court just Justice Anthony Kennedy stated recently that he has no intention of retiring until Obama is gone, end quote. Uh, apparently, the court has had enough. The Roberts court has signaled in a very subtle manner, of course, that it intends to address the issues about which Obama critics have been screaming to high heaven. A ruling against Obama for any one of these important issues could potentially cripple the administration, and such a thing is long overdue. First, there would be Obamacare which violates the constitutional principle barring the federal government from forcing citizens to purchase something. And no, that's not the same thing as states requiring drivers to purchase, uh, requiring drivers to purchase car insurance as some of the intellectually impaired claim. The, constitutional, the Constitution limits federal government, not state governments, from doing such things. And further, not everyone has to drive, and thus a citizen could opt out of purchasing car insurance by simply deciding not to drive a vehicle. In the Obamacare world, however, no, no citizen can opt out. Second, sources in the state, uh, sources state that the Roberts court has quietly accepted information concerning discrepancies in Obama's history that raise serious questions about his eligibility for the office of president. The change uh, goes far beyond the original birth certificate issue. This information involves president, uh, possible fraud of the social security number in Connecticut while Obama, or the, excuse me, the fraudulent use of social security number in Connecticut while Obama, Obama was a high school student in Hawaii. How did he get that social security number? That's question number one. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Third, several cases involving possible criminal activity, conflicts of interest, and pay-for-play cronyism could potentially land many uh, uh, administration officials, if not Obama himself, in hot water with the court. Frankly, nothing comes close to comparing the rampant corruption of this administration, not even during the Nixon years. Nixon and the Watergate conspirators look like choir boys compared to the jokers that populate this administration. In addition, the court will eventually be forced to rule on the dreadful decision of the Obama Department of Justice suing the state of Arizona. That, too, could send the Obama doctrine of open borders to an early grave, given that the administration refuses to enforce federal law on illegal aliens. And finally, the, big, the biggie that could put, potentially send the entire house of cards tumbling in free fall is the latest revelation concerning the Obama holder Justice Department and its refusal to pursue the new Black Panther Party. The group was caught on tape committing felonies by attempting to intimidate Caucasian voters into staying away from the polls. A whistleblower who resigned from the Department of Justice is now charging Holder with the deliberate refusal to pursue cases against blacks, particularly those who are involved in radical hate groups such as the new Black Panthers, who have been caught on tape calling them for the murder of white people and their babies. This is the, this one is a biggie and could send the entire administration crumbling. That is, if the justices have the guts to draw the line in the sand at the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Well said. I mean, I don't like one iota of a cracker. You know, it's just yeah. uh, that whole thing is, is uh, wow. And we have some more on Holder and, and the crew later on in the, uh, in the program, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, stand by. Yeah. That's the tip of our Department of Justice slap around. Absolutely. And this next piece was written by Lord Lloyd Marcus, a uh, Tea Partier and also a, a black American. Can one be truly black and patriotic? Famed TV minister Bishop T.D. Jakes said that when, our, when your perception is off, you do not realize or appreciate the true value of what you have until you've lost it. Is it fair to say that in general, black America's perception is off? regarding their country, which is, in reality, a tremendous gift from God. 
Some may think me insane for suggesting that it was a blessing for my ancestors to be betrayed by fellow blacks, sold to white slave traders, separated from their families, and shipped to a strange land to be slaves. But please hear me out. Interestingly, black America's journey to fulfill their destiny parallels that of Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, separated from everything he held dear, sold into slavery and taken to a strange land. While the Bible says Joseph had great favor with God, Joseph suffered greatly, including spending 13 years in prison for a crime of which he was innocent. Through a, through a series of divinely orchestrated events, remarkably, Joseph became a ruler of the very land which once enslaved and unfairly imprisoned him. Joseph was second in command to the king. Here's what the Bible says about Joseph's brother's betrayal. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We black Americans were betrayed by our African ancestral brothers. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And yes, blacks have suffered greatly in America. My 84-year-old dad's heart still bears deep scars from the racism he experienced in his youth. When dad was a young merchant marine, while on shore leave down in the south, whites tried to lynch him solely because he was colored. Dad's white fellow shipmates rescued him, saving his life. A point which is often overlooked and deliberately ignored by the race industry is that God has always provided a remnant of good, decent, mostly Christian white people to assist blacks in their struggle for liberation and equality. The race industry, which is for the most part fueled by the Democrat Party, would have you believe that all black progress in America has been achieved in spite of and void of any assistance from white America, when in reality white Americans have assisted in every major black achievement. Blacks are only 12% of the population. Therefore, Obama could not have been elected without millions of white votes. Oprah would not be Oprah had she not been embraced by millions of white viewers. American blacks are tremendously blessed to live in the greatest land of opportunity on the planet for all who choose to go for it. And yet, I sense that most blacks consider it somewhat traitorous to their race to be patriotic. They possess an extremely tragic and destructive false perception of their country. Black America, this is your country. A lot of white folks died alongside blacks to give you the freedoms, opportunity, and prosperity you enjoy today. During the Civil War, 330,000 white and 30,000 black Union troops paid the ultimate sacrifice to end slavery. During slavery, it was illegal to teach blacks to read. Still, white Christians taught blacks to read the Bible. It has been said that white slave owners also gave blacks Bibles to keep them in check, referring to the scripture, Servants obey your masters. I say they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Mary Ovington, a white woman, founded the NAACP. Bet that is a shocker considering race industry leaders such as Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, and Reverend Jeremiah Wright's portrayal of white America. Reverend Wright said, Barack knows what it means to be a black man living in a country and culture that is controlled by rich white people. Wright has also said, God damn America. Here's my response to Reverend Wright. Tell me of another country where a black kid from the hood who uses deplorable English and profane language, who demeans women, who calls for violence against the police, and who wears his pants down below his butt and raps about how racist America sucks for blacks can become a gazillionaire, critically acclaimed by sycophant whites in the music industry. Such as God elevated Joseph to ruler of a once torturous strange land, blacks are rulers in America, from the highest office in the land to multimillionaire entrepreneurs, Blacks are rulers in America, the same shores on which they first arrived as battered, bruised, and abused lowly slaves. Praise God. What burdens my heart is that it appears that the race industry has been successful in creating a false perception of America in the hearts and minds of many black Americans. White Christians, you have had our backs in the past. I pray that you will come to our aid once again. Please pray for black America. Pray that their eyes be opened to the greatness of America. God's wonderful gift to them. I pray that many more of my fellow blacks will boldly and sincerely join me in saying with great pride, I am an American. Here, here, Lloyd. I, I read that and I just had to bring it to the audience. I thought that was a, a touching piece uh, by someone who gets it. 
Yeah, and that's something we've been saying all along is we're not the one, you know, the white folk are not the ones that are holding anybody down. And there shouldn't be an Afro-American or an Italian-American or an Irish-American, Mexican-American, whatever. You're, they're, get rid of the hyphen, you're an American. And that's what Lloyd, how Lloyd signs his work, a proud, unhyphenated black American. And that's something that we've been saying on this show all along. Yeah. And it's something that, that why would we, and I both wholeheartedly agree with. Why what, Why would we want people to be in poverty and in gangs and doing drugs? Why would we want that? You no, know, it's, it's that, horrible. That, that, that makes no sense. I know. It's ridiculous. Now, uh, over at MSNBC, or was it CNN? I can't remember. It's MSNBC. They got some really loony tunes over there. But this one guy just went over the freaking cliff on Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, uh, I, I posted this story, and, and I want to give a little prelude to, to why. Uh, the story came out on um, Memorial Day, uh, and Chris Haynes, uh, who has since retracted this statement, but I don't care. The fact that he said this in the first place just irritated the hell out of me, and I'm going to bring it to, to our audience. Chris Haynes said he was uncomfortable with calling troops heroes, but yet he's quite comfortable in exercising the rights that they protect and give him the rights to say that. Uh, just in time for Memorial Day, some MSNBC drone named Chris Haynes has lit up the Internet with his confession that dead American troops don't quite measure up to his exacting standards for what he calls a hero. That's an end, end quote. Uh, the, I just, it, when I read that on, on Memorial Day, of all days, Memorial Day, so yeah, out of talking, taste, no taste at all. I mean, geez, oh man, how did he think that was going to go? You know, the the when he calls uh, dead American soldiers, they're not heroes. Every one of them guys, yeah, that that, that laces up the boots, that goes out in, into a war zone f to defend your freedom, to defend this country, and, and see what is they a don't, hero. what they don't understand. These people that never did anything in their damn life. What they don't understand is that that day that that guy got killed is not his first day on earth. He had yeah. to, like you said, he had to strap his boots off, up somewhere in the United States and had to go to a recruiter, and then he get, went through all his training. But then he knew he's got a television and everything else. He knows what's going on in the world. You know, yeah. When you sign up, you know what you're signing up for. But And, and, and anybody that tells you that they don't is an idiot. And because... there's, a, there's a lot of anticipation and anxiety because when you get orders to go to somewhere bad, you don't get them 10 minutes before you get on the plane. You get them months in advance, sometimes a year in advance. Well, and it's not only that, you know, the, the definition of hero is somebody that steps up while everybody else is backing away. Right. And, the, and there's 1% of this entire country's population that at one time or another stood up and, and, and did that. And to, to say that, uh, I mean, whether they saw war, whether they didn't, whether it was during the Cold War, whatever, right. they laced them up. You didn't and, know. <laughs> and, and there could have been any time. Right. And, and I know that we drill every, you know, every couple months and, you know, bag drags. And you don't know if that plane's actually taken off for a, a destination or not. And they'd, they'd, you know, drill us and we'd take our bags, they'd check our shot records, issue us, you know, whatever we needed to be issued, they'd put us on the plane. There have been times that I taxi down the runway and, and not knowing if we're going to wherever, you know. I mean, at that time, when I was at, at, uh, at Shaw, our uh, area of responsibility was uh, England, was in Europe. And then our, uh, our designation changed halfway through my tour there. So there were times when I thought, okay, we're on our way to England. Then, you know, we're on our way to the Middle East. You don't know. Right. And you signed up for and it. And the places you know? that you have to stay, the places you have to live and, and, and soldier or, or be an airman. You know, I was in the Republic of Korea, real close to the DMZ. And, I mean, it, it was a joke amongst the troops that, that we had, like, 17 seconds to live at the balloon went up. Yep. And we were just a speed bump. We were there, of course we were going to fight, but we were there to radio for help to make sure that the United States would come if we got overrun, yep. you know, and uh, I don't know, I'm glad nothing's going on over there. That's a militarized country like you've never seen, man. That, that place there, people don't talk about it much, but man, there's permanent fighting positions everywhere. Every damn buddy's in the Army. It's just something else. 
But my point is, you know, especially for on, on Memorial Day, oh, yeah. some classless piece of shit to come out and say that kind of garbage uh, on the day that we honor our fallen heroes. And that's yeah. right. I did say it. They're fucking heroes. <laughs> Every, everybody that goes out there that, that puts on a uniform is a fucking hero because at any given time they could be called and they can and, and they are more than willing and able to lay down their life for you. Oh, these people, these leftists hate the military. Did you see Bill Ayers? A while back when he was talking to somebody and he said, soldiers, the U.S. military, because sometimes some airlines allow military to board the plane first. Like you get these little freebies. And they should. And, and, and it's cool. You know what I mean? But he stands up there and says, no, they shouldn't be boarding first. Teachers should board first. And, this is, and I'm thinking, you don't get it, man. I mean, I don't care if I board the plane first, but people are trying to give back. They're trying to say, all right, the Vietnam era, Bill Ayers, your era is gone. Your era is erased. We're never doing that to our soldiers again. That's what those people are saying when they say let the military board first. You yeah. know, and, and he's just, he hates the military. He always has. He tried to blow up the NCO club at Fort Dix when they were having a freaking dance. Yeah. You he, know? He, he's a slimy piece he of is. shit, too. And, and they ought to call him out more than they do, like I said before. It's time to start making these uh, alliances known and start... Uh, you know, throw in the biography of people like Bill Ayers and Jeremiah Wright and Tony Rezko, who's sitting in federal prison, you know, and won't say anything about Obama. He'll talk about about the governor of Illinois, but he won't say anything about Obama. And he was Obama's partner, man. Oh, yeah. He, Obama bought his house from him. You know, so that whole thing's skewed. Uh, apparently, in the reversal, this is a, a kind of a different story. It's not your average story. Uh, but I read this thing in uh, Military Times. In a reversal, Army bans high-performance rifle mags. The Army has ordered that soldiers may use only government-issued magazines with their M4 carbines, a move that effectively bans one of the most dependable and widely used commercial magazines on today's battlefield. The past decade of war has spawned a wave of innovation in the commercial soldier weapons and equipment market. As a result, trigger pullers in the Army, Marines, and various service special operations communities now go to war armed with commercially designed kit that's been tested under the most extreme combat conditions. Near the top of such advancements is the PMAG Polymer M4 magazine, introduced by Magpul Industries Corp. Corporation, Corps, <laughs> Corporation in 2007. Its rugged design has made it one of the top performers in the small arms accessory arena according to combat veterans who credit the PMAG with drastically improving the reliability of the M4. Despite the success of the PMAG, Army officials from TACOM Life Cycle Management Command issued a safety of use message in April that placed it and all other polymer magazines on an unauthorized list. Now the reason that I brought this, that this caught my eye, is because I was at a gun shop the other day, a couple months ago, and I wanted to buy some replacement M4 magazines. And I wanted to, my only uh, requirement to the guy was I want them made in America. Because China has some cheap ass ones that you can't, you gotta be careful with magazines. Uh, so this guy shows me this magazine and I'm like, that's not even made out of metal. He said, you can run this thing over with a deuce and a half. No problem. And for our SCR TV viewers, I just happen to have one in my hand here. And it's a, a very outstanding model, far exceeds the aluminum government issue magazines. As you can see on the top, it has a cover that you can take off that protects your, the cleanliness of your rounds prior to usage. And it also has a very nifty gauge on the side. If you look there, you can see by that red line how many rounds you have in the magazine. So there's clearly 25 rounds in that magazine. I never fill them full. And you can see the rounds through the, uh, through the little sight glass there. And it can show you when your rounds, you can look at your magazine. You don't have to count rounds. You can look at them and you can see that 5 and 15 marks uh, when you start getting down. It also has on the bottom, this piece comes off very easily if you need to extend your spring or if you need to clean anything. So I just thought that that was, uh, it caught my eye. Because I said, man, that picture looks a lot like my magazine. And I went and looked at it, and see, it's the exact same one. Uh, and, and if you look at the rest of this article, you guys can go on the uh, show notes links page. 
uh, there's testimony in there from special forces, rangers, everybody else that think this is ridiculous. And uh, my guess is that they're going to disregard the safety use message. I mean, when you're out there on the on the battlefield, bureaucratic bullshit like that doesn't really bother you. I mean, it's like, what are you going to do? Find me, go ahead, but I'm coming home to get fined. You know, so yeah. so that was just uh, something that I felt like bringing to the audience because uh, I had a show and tell piece. You know, well, it, it's it's one of them things where it's 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 bullshit that troops are having to go and buy their own magazines because the ones that they're well, being the per, the per, issued are are crap. And it's not the it's not the military's fault per se. It, it's it is, but it's not. It, it's the process. It's well, the, here's the, the procurement thing. process. If, they spend a million dollars. On, on developing different things for these weapons, and you never see them. I mean, they do all these tests. I can't tell you. The M4 carbine is a substandard weapon. I mean, it's pat the thing was developed in the 50s. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's, uh, I mean, it's a good weapon, but there's superior weapon systems out there, and they've su su they were supposed to replace it years ago. And there's been so many studies that it just never happens, you know? So I, I don't know. It's I think it's... Uh, Probably a lobbyist for the manufacturer of the cheap ass aluminum magazines that you know they have thousands of. It's probably like that, one of the lobbyists or something. But I don't know. Hey, here's a. But, but I mean, it's one of the things where if you're going to battle, right? And okay, I'm I'm going to to Iraq, and you know they're going to issue me body armor, and I elect to spend my money to buy what I consider a better body armor. And if I want to use what I consider a better, better body armor, that's on me. And it's the same thing. They may issue me an aluminum, uh, you know, magazine. Uh, magazine, but and that's all well and good. But if I choose to use one that I spent my money on, that in my experience works better, why, why is that... It's you know, even better why is than that. that. Going to be illegal. It's Wait, even better illegal. than that. These magazines have a stock number. You can order them. I mean, they were ordering them. Their company supply sergeants were ordering these things with army money. I mean, but that, uh, it's that I can good. See them going against that. Oh, it's a good magazine, though. I'm telling you, they need to. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not discounting that. They need to think outside of the box. That's the. That's the thing. You know, if you find something different, then let's go with what's better. And, and a lot of times, bureaucrats in Washington, it's tough to get them to do that. You know, for instance, I'll just tell one quick story. We're running out of time here. Uh, but one of our maintenance companies had decided that, you know, had determined that the armored, armored security vehicle that we hardly use anymore needed additional armor in certain spots. So they put all this armor on them in certain spots, and then the Army decided we need to upgrade all these. So they had to take all their armor off so they could put armor back on. You know, <laughs> that's just the way it works, you know, with contracts and everything else. Yeah. Ward, why don't you give us uh, the second chapter of... Uh, Stedman's uh, role here. Uh, this article is called uh, Holder's Chutzpah. Uh, Attorney General Eric Holder has recently told a group of black clergymen that the right to vote was being threatened by people who are seeking to block access to the ballot box by blacks and other minorities. Now, didn't the Black Panther Party just get, can, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this is truly world-class chutzpah by Attorney General, who stopped attorneys in his own Department of Justice from completing the prosecution of black thugs who stationed themselves outside Philadelphia voting sites to harass and intimidate white voters. Huh, didn't I just say Wouldn't that? Wouldn't it be something to see the Supreme Court do something about that? I, I, that's the question. I, I don't know if they could. I don't know you what, know, I mean, that... It, it, the, it, it's one of them catch 22s in order for them to actually make a ruling there would have to have been a, a law passed i mean or, there was you know, there's they would civil, have to have been tried there's been if civil rights tried, legislation i mean they they could have they could i don't know how I, there has to be a way i mean the government was designed that the different branches could check the other branches maybe it would require congressional uh, congressional initiation or something but the, like that first story that you read was alluding to that to something that, you know, maybe if these guys would stand up to them. I, I mean, it'll get there. This case will get there at some I point. I hope so. I really do. Because it, the way that it's working now, it's not. You know, and that's that's the problem. Is the case is, it, it's just ridiculous that uh, the way that Holder it, it just comes off and, and, and he's so sacrimonious 
that it, I have the right to, to do whatever I want. Well, it's like what he did in Florida. You know, he, he the DOJ well, directed Florida, Florida's governor, their chief executive said, OK, I want my voters roll. I want these roles to be true. Take anybody off who's not eligible to vote. And the United States Department of Justice told him, no, you have to stop. And I'm thinking, what? Yeah, that, that's ridiculous. It is. It's treasonous. It, it should I mean, be it's up not to each state to, to police them. I mean, and that's the way it's supposed to work. The, the states police themselves and, and they're supposed to police their voting records to make sure that the that the people that are going out to vote are registered to vote and should be voting in that state. I truly think cetera, they've overstepped. They've overstepped with all this stuff, with the Arizona thing and, and with now with Florida, you know, and well, it, there's a combination of things in Arizona yeah, too. Hutch. Right. You, you look at number one, they they refuse to enforce federal law on illegal immigration. They're going after Sheriff Joe because <laughs> they say that that he's going out and and it's racial profiling. But you know, here's the thing: how is it racial profiling if the guy looks like a Mexican? Let's ask him if he's a Mexican. Why is that? Why is that illegal? It's all ridiculous. Why? The whole profiling thing. We've talked about it before. It's. Uh, but, but again, the the Holder administration because they can't get a legal thing on, on Sheriff Joe because they can't prove any of it. So they're going to go after Sheriff Joe and have him, you know, come on and it, it's basically, you know, let's bog him down with paperwork so he can't get the job done. That's what they're trying. And they're to trying do. to threaten him, and they're threatening the wrong guy. Yeah, I mean, that's what he I doesn't think. Back down. No. I found this other uh, this story here. Listen to this one. This one's kind of interesting. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but when I started reading this, I started thinking, wow, man, that, that's possible. The producer's theory of Sarah Palin. Watching Mitt Romney deftly punch back against Obama brings back traumatic memories of McCain's pitiful failure to do the same. To some careful observers in 2008, McCain seemed to be deliberately trying to lose. But doesn't this hit home? Yeah. So here's a new thought. Suppose McCain's real job was to gracefully lose and that picking Sarah Palin was part of the plan. McCain's dim-witted brain trust figured that picking an obscure first-term governor from Alaska was a certain deal-breaker with the American public. Instead, they discovered to their horror that Sarah was a smash hit and she might actually lead them to victory. Call it the producer's theory of 2008. Their beautifully planned certain flop was now a disastrous success. What lends credence to this model theory is this novel theory is that George Soros has been significantly funding McCain since 2001 and that many members of McCain's election team had Soros ties. I never knew that before. Me either. Furthermore, McCain was implicated in the Keating Five scandal in 1989 in which he received campaign contributions in exchange for protecting criminals from investigation. So his integrity is hardly unimpeachable. I think perhaps a backdoor deal was struck. What else, and listen to this one, what else could possibly explain the media career of Meghan McCain? Well, if George Soros catapulted Sarah Palin to national prominence, I finally found something to be grateful to him for. I just thought that was... Uh, that was that was one of those things that makes you go, hmm. Yeah, I mean, Megan th McCain is about dumb as hell, and that's true. How did she get there? You know, uh, you know. Well, she came out and she bad mouthed her dad. You know, it was that kind of thing. But I believe. I mean, I don't have any any kind of proof or anything like that. But I could. I swear to no, God, I, I mean, it does. It kind of makes sense. You know, but my thinking was always that because McCain was in a prison camp, he has a problem with confrontation so he 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 wouldn't seek a confrontation against obama whereas oh he his, rolled it out he rolled it out completely i mean it was like yeah that campaign was like out of disneyland whereas I, I, romney's taking he's hitting him with body shots <laughs> he's him again this week. <laughs> you know he he impresses me more every time maybe it's because i have to be impressed but really some of the things he did when he showed up in front of Solyndra. And had, yeah. a, had a press conference and didn't tell anybody he was going there. You know, that was yeah, beautiful. That, well, and, and on top of that, you consider he was coming out and, uh, you know, Romney's or Obama's trying to tie him to, you know, Bain Capital. He's like, yeah, it was a job. I had a job. I, I actually had a job and I was working. So that, you know, 
that's what we did. That's what Bain Capital does. And, and on the same day, Robert Obama goes to a $35,000 a plate dinner with another venture capitalist. Yeah, You know, exactly. Blackbird then, or whatever it was. Well, what I thought was great was while Obama's crying about Bain Capital, this, that, and the other thing, all Romney does is kind of says, what about Solyndra? Oh, it's great. <clears throat> what about Solyndra? <laughs> and that's what, we've been, that's what we said. We said that's the strategy to take. They yeah. talk about your grandfather's six wise. What about that fifteen trillion? You know, yeah. don't even. But you know what? They were hitting them back in spades though a couple times, like with the yeah. bullying deal. They pulled pulled out this fifty year old bullying deal, bullying deal, and then the the Romney campaign or whoever throws out the the thing in his book about him bullying a little girl. Yeah. You know, it's just great when they do this stuff. I mean, with the dog, he throws the dog on the roof. Obama eats the dog. Yeah. You know, things aren't going well for these people, man. This is going to be, you know, short of the, the problem that I have, the, uh, the fear that I have, is that they're going to get pushed so far in the corner that they're going to start a war or something. Well, here's the thing. Obama can't really hit Romney on a whole lot, you know. That's scary. And, and he can't run on his record because his record sucks. What's he going to say? You know, okay, well, I have, I have a law – that, that's going to give everybody free health care, but you, you, I really can't talk about it because the Supreme Court's probably going to vote it out in, at the end of this month. And, and he's telling his so. people closest to him that I need another term so I can fix health care. And what that means is single payer. That's what yeah. that means. That's code for everybody's coming under my butt. As soon as I get reelected, everybody's going to be communist health care. And there's going to be death panels, and I'm going to tell you they're death panels. Yeah. You well, know? I mean, here's the thing. I think that the president of the United States should be a man of his word. And what, I, I do. I, mean, I do, too. It, it's one of them things. No. You know, I, and that's I why the leftists that. That's why the leftists are so pissed off, because they know he's a Marxist, but he won't say it. Yeah, but I, 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 I'd like my, to believe my president was a man of his word. You know, and when Obama ran, he said, if I don't fix the economy in three years, you can call me former President Obama. And we will. I'd like to hold him to that. And we will, certainly. We'll, we'll oblige him that. That's no problem. Uh, did you know that Barack Hussein Obama is using your tax dollars to flood Israel with thousands of Af African Muslim infiltrators? In a highly disturbing piece of news at KR8 Israeli Patriot, the online magazine reports that the Obama regime is providing funds via the UN to flood the Jewish state with Muslim illegal aliens from Africa. JDL UK, the funds, quite bizarrely, are only between 1,000 and 2,000 per illegal, per month. Not enough to cover food, let alone rent. Uh, however, in what is being seen as the likely incentive for carrying out this migratory sabotage of the Jewish state is the fact that these funds are being split with a portion of it going to unnamed sources at various stages of the transfer from its way from the U.S. to Israel. In other words, considering that hundreds of illegals penetrate Israel's borders daily, someone is profiting from this venture handsomely, probably out of Chicago somewhere. You know, this, just, this reeks. Uh, what's fairly well known is that the police bring the refugees from the Egypt-Israel border right up all the way to South Tel Aviv, the central bus station. But that's not all. What else is now coming to light is that with these funds, these illegals are somehow opening businesses and will soon start their own newspaper. There's further testimony in the audio interview in which it is alleged government inspectors frequently close down illegal Jewish-owned businesses, but not the illegal businesses belonging to the illegal immigrants. This financial improbability of all this likely hints towards further sources of funding which are as yet undetected. Israelis take to the streets to protest the soaring crime rates caused by the influx of illegals in southern Tel Aviv. I'll tell you, that's just, uh, that's despicable. And, and, and I'll tell you something else. The Israelis aren't going to put up with it. No. I was talking to, they, I was talking to Josh Wander that. about this, and, and it's, uh, you know, the Israelis, they'll, they'll start building fences and stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's not like in this country where they say, well, we're going to build fences and, oh, that's profiling and you can't do that. The, the, the Israelis don't play that game. They'll build, not only build a fence, they'll electrify the fucking thing and put a motor around it. You know, so don't think for one minute that just because, you know, the way things happen here. Yeah, you know, the Israelis. Are too, too touchy-feely. The you know, Israelis don't play. The goddamn Israelis spied on us. 
You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you look at – what was the, – there, there was a group that went down to the uh, Mexican border. Yeah. And, and, and they were supplementing the border guards to help out the border guards. And the federal government stepped in and said, no, you can't do this. So this is totally – yeah. You it, know, and th these were civilians – who were vol civilian volunteers that were basically protecting our border, and they were told by the federal government they had to stand up. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, just the whole idea of them telling Arizona that they can't protect themselves. It's like... That's ridiculous. It's nuts. It's, it's Alice in Wonderland. And, and I think, I honestly think, and I said this last week, I think this is going to be a, a freaking landslide. I do. Yeah. I, I just think America is smarter than this. And, and even Democrats, man. There's Democrats. There's no way that they can. I mean, look at that. There's been numerous Democrats that have switched parties lately. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like it's like I've said on the show before. You know, people that voted for Barack Obama the first time to prove that they weren't racist. Now you got to vote against him to prove you're not stupid. Yeah, and not anti-American. I mean, the things that he's done uh, that are so harmful. Uh, and, and, they, and, and they fly in the face of the Constitution. Absolutely. I mean, it's that simple. It's not, it, it's not some so, sort of secret code you have to freaking crack. You yeah. just got to know what the Constitution is. And for him to come out and, number one, say that there's absolutely nothing in the uh, health co the healthcare bill that's uh, unconstitutional shows that, number one, he doesn't understand the Constitution. And, number two, when he actually had the audacity to challenge the Supreme Court on whether or not they could overturn a law that they deemed was unconstitutional shows that I, I want to see his fucking law degrees. Oh, yeah. I want to I, I see his school because if he was an instructor. He was he stoned the whole law, time. He was stoned the whole time through college. Give me a break, man. He didn't if, stop. If he, no, he was, he was a law professor, right? If yeah. he was a fucking law professor, that, I want to know how he was able to be a law professor when he doesn't understand the separation of powers, when he doesn't understand the rights and the and, and what the Constitu what the uh, Supreme Court can do and what the Constitution means. How can you be a constitutional he understands, law professor? He understands all that. He just doesn't agree with it. He doesn't. Oh. He's a Marxist, and, and he's using all his credentials and everything to ruin this country. He wants to take this country down a few notches. I mean, that's his. That's his goal. I guarantee it. Uh, dreams from my father, his Kenyan father, that that was uh, railed against the, the the United Kingdom's colonization of Kenya. You know, and his grandfather, who was. Uh, actually imprisoned by him for a while. I mean, this guy hates America. Him and Jeremiah Wright and all the rest of them. You know, Bill Ayers. And I'll tell you, the press, the damning, the most damned thing in this whole world of these last three years is the press. The press is, is just absolutely dropped the ball and are completely lost their credibility. And there ought to be a way, and there is with dollars, and it's starting to happen, but these old bastards ought to be torn down. Well, it's, they really the whole, should be. I, there's nothing going on. There, it, it's, it, everything's good. No, Every, yeah. Everything's perfect. It's their fault because there's people that aren't as passionate about it as we are because they're passionate about other things. Because we've got it so damn easy in this country, they're afforded the possibility to be passionate about other things and don't really have to worry about this. But we're getting to the point where it's going to affect everybody in a terrible way. And they're going to say, damn, I didn't know that was happening. Well, here's the question that, that everybody has to ask themselves. Now, you've seen, uh, you've seen video from Al Jazeera, and you've seen videos from, you know, these other news organizations outside of the United States. Now, of those news organizations, how many of them are sponsored by the government? How many of them are government-sponsored news organizations? So they tell, like Chavez. Chavez's news organization tells you what Chavez wants you to hear. He's about they, ready to assume it, room temperature, too, man. He's in a bad way. Yeah, but my point is, that's basically what you have here. And, and nobody has the balls to come out and say it, but that's what it is. Yeah. Our news organizations here are under the thumb of the Democratic Party. Right, it's only one party. party line. They're, they're not in... They're not investigative against the, de no, the Democrats. They only investigate against the Republicans. And then when they can't get get it the way they want it, they make shit up. Oh, yeah. And for that, I'll put in C. Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Absolutely. Because they, they, tried, him in, they try, tried him in the press before he even went to court. Yep, that's he was true. Found he was found 
you know. And that's not over yet either. It's, it's, it's sad, but that's not over yet. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Citizen X in the chat room, what's going on. Uh, that's about all the time we have. Uh, please remember to follow us, SCRPGH, on Twitter. And what else are we doing, Ward? We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steel City Resistance. Uh, recommend your friends. Give us the, do the like thing. You know, uh, we have 44 regular members. We want to have 44,000. So log on, do the like thing, pass us on to your friends, recommend us to your friends. Uh, see how many people we can get in there. See, let's see if we can blow it up. Let's, yeah, let's try go. and let's see if we can make uh, Mark Zuckerberg call us and go, hey, how about how about you know call <laughs> off the dog? Thanks to Teacot for the couple of retweets we had on Twitter. That was nice. Uh, nice. All the folks on Freedom Connector on the Steel City Resistance Group and other groups that I post to from time to time, and uh, email the show SteelCityResistance at gmail dot com. Call the show. 412-254-3750. And I'd just like to thank you for letting us into your life for an hour. And Ward, you got anything? No, sir. I'm over and out. We'll see you next week.